And open up your Bibles today. We'll be in Luke 18, continuing through in some of the parables of Jesus, getting towards the end of this series. In our our life, we talk a lot about confidence. And in things like in the workplace or in sports like football or musicians, you know, wherever you are in life, you want to have confidence in what you're doing. Confidence directs how it then gets fleshed out. In child raising, for example, we we find, and I know that when I first had our first child, we didn't have very much confidence. It seems to be amplified when you're dealing with another human life. Is the food good for them? Are car seats okay? This one okay? Cribs, choking hazard, stranger danger? I mean, all the things that we deal with with children. Back in the 1920s, I, I wonder if you know this. I learned this. Back in the 1920s, I mean, obviously before my time, okay, before most of us, right, or all, all of us here, um, there was such a thing as baby cages. You ever hear these? Baby cages. Take a look at this. So what they, so what they did is they put their, their baby outside their window in a cage to get fresh air. And it might be like 10 stories up off the ground, and there's your baby hanging out the window. Now, can you imagine doing that today? Can you imagine what kind of like outcry there would be with a baby hanging out the window of your apartment so you can get fresh air? We use, we use uh, play pens now, but they're not outside the building like that. Most of us couldn't confidently do that to our child. It's like an air conditioner, you know, like and even those sometimes, are, they move too much and it's nervous, right? Now, no injuries reported in these, by the way. So I asked my wife about this this week and I said, look what I found, you know, and she's like, how many people were killed? Well, nobody, as far as we know. So maybe well, they'll be coming back here soon. Who knows? <laughs> confidence, though. We don't have confidence in that. We have confidence in other things now. Confidence directs how we live life and what we do or don't do. In our Christian faith, we talk about confidence in Christ. And we talk about it interchanging the word trust. I trust in Jesus. I have confidence in Jesus. I have belief in Jesus. But, you know, this, this story we're going to read today is a story of a man who had misplaced his trust. His trust was in the wrong place. And when that happens, it totally redirects your life. It takes you in a different way than maybe you'd hope you were going. Last week, we read a story right before this about someone who, uh, a persistent widow who went before, you know, his idea of that God, go before God in prayer and keep asking God in prayer. And the question, of course, is, Do you trust God enough to ask him? And if you do, then ask him. Because if you say you trust God and don't ask him, then do you really trust God? And that's kind of the continuing thought we'll have here today. The parable is a man who had misplaced confidence, and he didn't understand at all really what it meant to be close to God. So I'm going to read this. Luke chapter 18, starting in verse 9 and reading through verse 14. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. I want to look at two uh, different characters in this story and ask the question, how do we know our confidence is in the right place? Because that's what it really comes down to, right? How do we know that my confidence is in the right place? Because there's a word of caution here. Because there's differences in the way these two live and the way they think. But really, at the surface, you might not notice the difference. If you just looked at both of them, you might not ever catch the difference right away. So we want to take this to heart because it's easy to have some of the right things being said or the right motives being thought about, but really be far away from Christ in it. So first, we have the Pharisee. The Pharisee was confident in the work of God demonstrated in him. 
The parable um, is a parable. It's not based. It's not a true story, but it, it probably was based on some true events that had been seen in the temple, where uh, the Pharisee uh, go, had gone in there and done something like this before. The Pharisee in the story is not much different than you or me. He wants to please God. He's trying to show kindness to people. He's trying to do the right things. He wants to do the wrongs. He wants to avoid the the wrong things. He goes to worship in the temple. Uh, He believes that God is doing work in his life. He acknowledges that God is doing work in his life. So what's the problem? The problem is in verse 9. It says that to some who are confident of their own righteousness, he was confident in his own righteousness. He talks endlessly about God and doesn't know anything really about God. He doesn't know God personally. He's trusting in the works that God is perhaps demonstrating in his life or in front of him, but he's not actually trusting in the person of God himself. It's a slight difference, but it's very important. You see, there was plenty to celebrate. I mean, look at what he says. There's plenty to celebrate. He's had a good life, but he's missing the real source of life. He's focused on the outward man. And so you think about this. If this is you, if this is me, and we credit ourselves with our amazing spiritual lives and say, well, look at how great my, look at how great I am. It's very easy in that place to look at everybody else and say, what's wrong with all of them? And why can't they get it right when I've got it right? It's easy for me. And that's the, the comparison game that's going on here. It's a very dangerous place. But if we want to be very real for a moment, we could say, this, that in our own life, if we wanted to feel good about ourselves, we can always find someone who we can look at and say, well, they're worse than me, so I must be doing okay. Problem, of course, that's a sinful way to look at life. It's a sinful way to live. It's not a wise way to live. In fact, Paul wrote about this in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 12. We do not dare, he says, to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves when they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves. They're not wise. So if your measuring device for what righteousness is is you, you've got a flawed measuring device or measuring stick on that. The Pharisee had a superiority complex. He thought he was better than everybody else. I mean, look at the text. He is morally righteous. He says, I'm glad I'm not a robber, an evildoer, an adulterer, or even like that tax collector right there. Praying out loud. Can you imagine doing that? If I stood up here and I said, you know, I'm so glad I'm not like that guy. Oh, yeah, look at Jeff. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just teasing. But our, the moral standards of this guy is high. They're high standards. He, he does the right things. He knows the Ten Commandments. He probably even keeps most of them or some of them or sort of, you know. He's self-righteous. He, he just goes through life as he wishes and worships God just enough to make his conscience feel okay. So because he's like, well, God's not going to reject a good person, will he? That's, that's the mentality. He's morally righteous. He's religiously righteous. Look at what it says. He goes to the temple and he prays. Two times a day they had a, a time to set, set apart to pray. It was like in the morning, 9 a.m. or 3 p.m. in the afternoon. They'd go and they'd pray publicly. They would fast. Fasting was not an unusual thing. They would, some people fasted like this guy twice a week. The second and the fifth day they did this to follow Moses. And what Moses did when he went up to Mount Sinai to receive the law on the fifth day and came down on the second day. So they fasted those days, depriving the food of body to focus on God and to strengthen their spiritual life. Interesting thing, though, is that the second and fifth day were also market days meaning that there were more people in town to show off to. And so people come to town to do their markets, their business, and all these people are, oh, I'm I'm fasting. They're they're showing off their spiritual superiority. And uh, Jesus spoke a lot about that and said, don't do that. Public fasting, public prayer, it's not about you, and it's about God, and do it for him, and in your closed rooms, and away from people, so you don't get to the point where you're going, look at me, look at me, look at me. But that's what they were doing. It says he also gave a tenth of all he has. Tithing is a popular thing. Uh, We talk about that in the church today, 10% and all that kind of thing. But even in that day, they would give more than 10%. And uh, he was giving even more than that. A tenth of all he had, all he belonged to him. So he was giving it all away. 
thought he was superior. He was very arrogant, very proud, very boastful. So you get the idea, right? This guy liked himself. I heard a story about an, this ancient rabbi who, who said that uh, if there were 30 righteous people in the world, two of them would be me and my son. And then he says, if there were only 10, it'd be me and my son. If there were only two, it would be me and my son. If there was only one, it would be me. It's like, how, how do you even say that and not feel bad about yourself? It's a bold statement to make. But you know, this guy was very genuine in his desire to please God. He was very genuine. He wanted, to, he wanted to worship God. He was not putting on a show that way. He would go to the temple and he would talk and he would speak very loudly and pray very loudly. But we noticed about his prayer that he was in there talking about himself and calling it prayer. <laughs> I, I, me, me. You know, if you're doing that, it's all you're talking about is yourself and yourself and yourself in prayer. You're probably just talking about yourself and maybe not really praying. But he probably had this picture of God as this taskmaster. I've got to do these thing, things in order, and when I get to this point, I'm good. That's how God operates, right? No, that's not how God operates. He had confidence in the work of God, not in God. I challenge you to have some spiritual conversations. I hope you're doing that or thinking about that. One of the guys I was talking with this last week is a guy who grew up in the church, and he said to me, you know, he had just given up on it and not really sure anymore. And I just said, well, can I ask you why? Like, what was it that changed that for you? And, and he said to me, he was, one, never a fan of people telling me what to do. Two, he didn't like all the rules that people put on other people. He didn't think it was how Jesus would have done it. He didn't think it, it made sense that we've made all these man-made rules we put on people. And I would say, well, you know, he's probably on to something there, isn't he? The churches can get into such trivial issues at times and miss the big picture. I heard a story about a, a pastor friend of mine who had a brother that came to church after many years he showed up to church. And he looked like he had been through the ringer. You know, he just was messy, didn't smell very good, had all the, you know, the, the clothes were all ratted and tangled up and everything else. And, and uh, after he was leaving the service, one of the ushers says to him, next time you come back, dress a little nicer. Yeah, I know, that's what I thought too. Oh. That hurts. And you know what happened? He didn't come back. And he didn't come back until the next time he did, he came back, he was dressed nicer, but he was in a coffin. And he had died in a motorcycle accident. And uh, it's just a sad story. It's hard to understand that because that gospel doesn't say, clean your shirt. It says, clean your heart. To think that we could be like a Pharisee like this, standing up in front and with our puffed up chest and saying how great we are, how great we are, and missing what God is calling us to do. We can cover this at times in righteousness, like prayer requests. You know, like, uh, we, oh, we should really pray for so-and-so. I mean, they, you know what they're doing? You know how they're struggling? They need Jesus, you know? There's, there's problems sometimes in that as well. So what happens to the Pharisee and his prideful attitude? Well, he's so full of self-consciousness that all he thinks about is himself, and it's all about him, and guess what happens? It says he is condemned. There's nothing changed at all inside of him. The outside looks nice. The inside's messy. He hasn't changed anything. He hasn't done anything but a sin. And so he's condemned. Now, the tax collector, <coughs> his confidence is in, the, is in the work of God for him. See the difference? He's, his confidence is in God himself. And Jesus uses a shocking example because can there ever be a tax collector who is good? Tax collectors in this day were Jews working for Rome and uh, they were trying to make a living, but they overtaxed people because Rome didn't share. So Rome didn't give you a share of what you took. You had to tax people more and keep the proceeds. And so they were doing that. They were looked at as thieves, as traitors, certainly not as heroes as they look in this story. And of course, most of us don't appreciate or enjoy dealing with the IRS either, right? <laughs> It's not something we look forward to. We've been audited a few times over the years. <clears throat> One time the IRS doubled our, doubled our income, and I had to deal with, for whatever reason, they decided to double it, which I didn't actually get double the income, so I had to pay double the taxes, and I didn't get double the income. So I called them, I sent letters, I waited on hold for over an hour. The guy writes, reads me a form on the internet and tells me that's as far as my training goes. I'm sorry, it hangs up on me. I mean, it was just 
it was, it was awful. Right? So I get it. <laughs> Tax collecting is, is not something we go like, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good thing. <coughs> By the way, all the audits that they ever did were their errors and not ours. So just so you know. I, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> they were. Clerical errors. But tax collectors are a load of fun. Okay, I get that. But this tax collector is the one that's forgiven for his sins. Not the Pharisee, not the religious guy, not the guy going to the temple twice a week, but the guy who is stealing from people, he's the one that's forgiven. How scandalous, how radical of Jesus to use an example like this. Now this Pharisee in the story, he feels the judgment of the, of the Pharisee. The, the tax collector feels the, the Pharisee's judgment because he made the point in his public prayer to include the tax collector and all the sinful, horrible people. Thank you, I'm not like that guy. And he took the hint. In verse 13, we see that he is standing at a distance. So he might be in the temple, but he's way over there. He doesn't feel like he can be anywhere near the altar. Nowhere near where the religious people are because he's unworthy. He knew he's unworthy. And this godly man is telling him he's unworthy too. So he knew it and he felt it. It's bad enough to feel like you're a sinner and you know, yourself without having somebody remind you that you're a sinner. And he prays, it says. He prays and he asks the Lord. He says, Lord, God, I'm, I'm the worst. I'm, I'm a sinner. I'm the worst of sinners. I, I'm just, I can't get this, this right. I'm, I'm a mess. He agrees. The Pharisee's right. But he stays in the presence of God, knowing that he needs to deal with this sin. He can't just let it go anymore. See, when you get a good look at sin in your life, you want to get rid of it, don't you? When you finally see like the ugliness of the heart, you go, I just need to get that out of there. And he grieves, it says in verse 13, he grieves the sin. God, have mercy on me. He beat his breast. He didn't even look up to heaven. He couldn't, he couldn't even lift his eyes up. He was so ashamed of what he'd done. He felt the weight of his sin. He beat his chest as if to say, oh, this wicked heart of mine. He called himself what he was. He was desperate for help. He was a sinful person. He could do nothing to change it. And he knew it. He needed God. Paul wrote this way. Remember in Timothy, when he was writing to Timothy, he wrote this. He says, I was, you know, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. And he believed that, like, Oh, God, why me? I mean, I, look at Paul did. Paul was a guy who was out killing Christians, and now he's, he's with them, and he's sharing the gospel with people. See, there's real value in the position the tax collector takes in this story. Not that we only wallow in our sin and go like, oh, I'm such a terrible person, but there's a place for grieving, isn't there? There's a place to stop and say, oh, God, I'm so sorry that I did that. I, I shouldn't have done that. I would argue that that's really where repentance begins, when we really feel the weight of our sin and we go to God and say, God, I, I, I need you. I can't deal with this. I don't want to do this anymore. Let's say I wanted to demonstrate my, I was thinking it like this. Let's say I wanted to demonstrate my strength for you. And so I got a really tall ladder and I went up to the top here and I grabbed onto something. I don't know what I grabbed onto. The fan might kind of fall, but something I could grab onto and hold onto. How long do you think I could, I could hold, up, hold on before I fell down? Well, I'm not a weightlifter, right? You can see that. So it wouldn't be very long, and my arms would start to quiver, and my hands would slip, and I would feel the weight of my body. I would, I would, I would uh, suddenly realize that I can no longer bear my own weight, and I would fall. All of us would do that. Some of you are probably a little longer than me, but you know, at some point we're going to fall because we can't bear the weight of that any longer. We just can't do it anymore. It's the same way with our sin. At some point, we need to come to the point where we no longer can live underneath that weight. We need to get rid of it. See, if you're living in sin and not feeling the weight of that sin, you don't have a correct view of yourself before God. If you read the Bible and you immediately conclude that this is no longer for me, that this is irrelevant to us, read it again. 
Because sin should disgust us, it should frustrate us, it should put us on our knees, it should cause us to come before God, hands open and say, God, I need to be healed because I'm a mess. My heart is a mess. I need to be forgiven. I can't do it on my own. I can't go to the temple enough and pray enough prayers to make this happen. I need you. And tax collector does that. He says, God, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me, a sinful person. He understands he has no right to ask for it, but he does because he understands that God can do something about it. And it's humility, humility that he comes in. Verse 13, there's repentance, there's humility. He asks God for mercy. Be merciful to me. See, we read this understanding and knowing that Jesus has gone to the cross, died, and risen. So we've got like the rest of the story. But when this was being told, Jesus had not done that yet. But he was foreshadowing this in the way he was talking about this. Be merciful to me. It was it, The way the wording is there in the, the, the original language, it really has the, the, the feel of atonement. Remember the Old Testament concept here that the sins of the sacrifice were offered as a covering for the sin of the people. And that God would then take that blood sacrifice and he would accept that as an offering for the sins of people and they would be forgiven. Making amends, making yourself right with God, that sort of thing. And so he's asking God, God, because of your sacrifice, which hasn't happened yet, right? Be merciful to me. Be merciful to me. I can't do it myself. This is, this is on you to, to work in my life, God, and I'm open to that now. Please do with it that. So we're in this story, aren't we? We've done things that God said not to do. Said things we shouldn't have said. But if you've trusted in Jesus as your Savior, there is an exchange that takes place. It's the, the, the heinousness of sin that we feel and that way of that sin taken away and God then gives us the righteousness, the sinlessness of Jesus, which is like, how is that even possible for us? It's not, unless he does it. Sin deserves death. But thanks be to God, he took my sin and he gave me life. He gave me sinlessness. Now, does that mean I never, never mess up anymore? Well, no, of course not. We are living in a fallen world and our flesh is leaning away from God still. But it does mean that he forgives us. The word used in the text here is justification. Verse 14, he went home justified before God. That's a legal sort of understanding that he takes a crime that has been committed and he wipes it clean. That you're no longer looked at as the criminal, and now you're looked at as the one who is innocent. It's the work of God through Christ in us. So let's ask the question again and bring this home then for us. How do I know that my confidence is in the right place? Well, there are three characteristics that I'd like to kind of give to us as we conclude this text today, and that is to help us understand if, if we're confident in Jesus or if we're confident in ourselves. One is humility. If you think you have it all figured out and that you've got your life in order and there's no problems, I'd say go back and read the Bible again. Because I, I know from my own life, anytime I've ever thought that way, I've been, com I've been completely, completely wrong. I've been, been, been uh, in the midst of some sort of sin and probably was just trying to justify it. We're sinners saved by grace. We do that and we need Christ to reach out and rescue us. And that's what he does. Superiority has no place. That's one of the things we see, that superiority has no place in the kingdom of God because at the cross, it's level. And that's, that's the, that we're all there. It doesn't matter if you're a, a pastor or you're not a pastor or whatever your story is. We come to the cross as equal. Needing a savior. Needing forgiveness. Humility is a value to God. He went home. It says here in the end of verse 14, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Humility is valued to God. So humility. The second one is repentance. Repentance is a big word. But think of it like this. I'm going this way and now I, I drop all that I have and I go a different direction. And I, I no longer am following the world and the sinful nature that's been so prevalent in my life. I am now turning and taking Jesus for myself. And the weight of my sin is now on him and I live free in him. I've decided 
to follow Jesus and not that other thing, and not that other way, not myself. It's an ongoing thing, but it is meaningful in that we have in our mind this, this thought that we're not going to just sin and ask for forgiveness later, but that we really feel that grief. And we say, Jesus, I, I really am sorry. Like, I really am sorry. I'm not just saying that because I need to, but I am sorry. I have sorrow for what I've done. And finally, there is an asking or a seeking that goes on. Whatever word you like, Jesus stands ready to forgive anyone who will ask. The tax collector or the religious crowd doesn't matter. What matters is that you ask and that you come hum- humbly and say, I need you. I, I want you. We place our confidence exclusively in Christ and not his work in you, but on him. And then the work comes, but we have to start with looking at him first. The very life of Christ himself. John Piper said it like this, We are not justified by the righteousness that Christ works in us, but by the righteousness Christ is for us. I'll say it again so you can tweet it, okay? No, I'm just kidding. We are not justified by the righteousness that Christ works in us, but by the righteousness Christ is for us. It's a subtle difference, like I said, but an important one. So which one are you? Pharisee, tax collector. Maybe somewhere in between. But one was justified and one was condemned. And so I urge you as we conclude this morning to ask the Lord to shine a light on your heart and ask him to to open up those areas in you that maybe you've shut off. As he takes up residence in our lives, you know, there's areas that maybe we like to kind of say, okay, this far, no further, because that's a little more uncomfortable when you go there. But let's be serious before him today and ask him to, to take those areas and open them up. Because if we have confidence in Christ, that means all, all of us. That means every part of us. It means that thing that we're hanging on to that we don't want to give up, that we don't want him to deal with because it's going to be too painful. Open it up. We all need help. I need help. We need help all the time. Confidence in Christ is where it comes. Not the church. The church helps, of course, but we start with Christ. Christ. Not your parents, not the pastor. It's between you, it's you and, and Christ and Him alone. For kids, the most important decision you ever make in your life is whether you follow Jesus or not. And adults, the same for you. It's not too late for you. If you've not trusted in Jesus, you can trust in Him today. If you've wandered away, if you feel like you're, you're kind of being pulled, you can come back to Him today and, and say, Lord, I want to trust you. My, my flesh is weak. Confidence is, is failing. And I want to trust in you. And so would you come before the Lord with me and respond in the way that he'd have you respond. Maybe you want to trust him today exclusively for the first time. Maybe you've done that halfway before or never at all. And So come and ask him today to be your Savior, to be your Lord. Say, Jesus, I want to trust in you today. I haven't done that. I trust in you today. And maybe the Lord is challenging you to renew your confidence in life in him today. And so again, Lord, I trust in you for all that I have before me now, for all of my struggles and fears, for all of my sinfulness that weighs on me. I trust in you. I'm confident in you. Father, we are a people in a desperate place. And so we need to be reminded of that. Don't want to be so arrogant like this example in this story to stand up and puff our chest and say, oh, look at, look at me, look at how great I am. Lord, we are all recipients of your mercy and grace. All of us, we, we mess up. So Lord, I pray for each person here and each family and each, each life that you would open up hearts today to, to trust, to have confidence in Christ, in Christ alone. For those who have never received you, Lord, open up hearts today that they would receive you and say, Jesus, I want want you. I want to be forgiven. I want to be set free. I want to do the religion thing. I I want to have a relationship with you. 
Lord, I pray for those who are being challenged to renew in some way confidence in their life. Lord, give them a sense of your assurance and your life in them, that they would know that you walk with them, that you enable them, and that as, you, as we ask, you give. And you keep giving, and you keep giving because you love us so much. We love you. We thank you, Lord, for the examples that Jesus gave to us in these stories and how they do open our eyes. Help us not to forget, and not to walk out of here and just say, oh, nice message, but Lord, to really take it to heart today and to, 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 to evaluate and to say, Jesus, I want to be close to you. I want to be closer to you. I want to be open to what you have for me. We love you. We praise your name today. In Jesus' name we pray all this. Amen. This morning we'll be concluding our service with a, a hymn of response. You guys can come on up there.